morning, everyone. It's Brad Berzer, American Heritage. Hope you guys are all doing well. I am recording this on Tuesday, April 7th, but it is for the Wednesday, April 8th, 2020 class in the time of plague, right? So I hope you guys, I shouldn't make light of that. Um, obviously, it's a very serious thing. And I hope you guys are all doing extremely well and uh, spending some good time with your families. All right, this morning, we are going to focus on a number of different things. But in particular, I want us to look to a document that we have at our reader, one of my, my favorite documents, and one that I actually I'm happy to have contributed to the reader because I found it when I was working on my master's thesis. And it is this piece called The Eclipse of Liberalism. And yes, I'm slowly finding it here if you're wondering what I'm doing. It is on page 577. And I have to make a, a quick couple of notes about this. So page 577 of your reader. And what, of course, the author means by liberalism is not what we mean by liberalism in 2020. He means it in the old sense of those who follow Thomas Jefferson and the Declaration of Independence. So those people who basically believe in free minds and free markets and focus on that as kind of the essence. Remember, what is the essence of good gov government? One more thing, that it does not interfere with our lives or take from the mouth the, the bread that it has earned. So we'll keep that in mind, that it's that kind of liberalism. Uh, we could even say, I could, given what we've talked about a lot in our class, that it really could be called the eclipse of republicanism in terms of believing in a small republic and a constitutional republic. So that's one thing that I think we have to say about this document before we even get started. The second thing we have to say about the document, though, is that I, Brad, got the author wrong. It was not E.L. Godkin. And even though uh, we're going to be looking at this piece, I'll probably say a couple of times, as Godkin says, it was not actually E.L. Godkin. He was the editor of the magazine in which it appeared. It appeared anonymously, and I very incorrectly and stupidly presumed that he was the author. But my very fine colleague and good friend, Richard Gamble, found out that it was actually a guy by the name of David McGregor Means, who was a writer for uh, the nation at the same time that E.L. Godkin was editor. So it's actually David McGregor Means, M-E-A-N-S, who is the author of this. Okay, so those two caveats aside, let's jump right in to this very important document written in 1900. So get the, the time period there. We are at the very end of one century, very beginning of another century, and Godkin doesn't really have a name for what's changing, and the world itself actually looks really peaceful at this time. So if you were just to say, let's look out at the world, let's figure out what's going on in the world, you wouldn't see a lot of conflicts. There had certainly been some major conflicts in the previous 30 years, in particular the, the American Civil War, but also uh, wars that Germany was involved in, especially in the wars that led towards German unification and solidity fight it. Uh, there had been a lot of very dangerous wars in Europe, but nothing, no wars that would be the equivalent of, say, the Great War for Empire that we saw uh, back in, in the 1700s, and nothing like what's coming with World War I. And yet, in some way, Means here, as author of this piece, sees that something is coming like World War I and maybe even World War II and possibly another one after that. Uh, and that that's what gives this piece so much power. Not only is it written in this kind of in-between nexus, in-between centuries, but also in-between wars. So it's an inter... Yeah, it's, it's a, an interwar piece that doesn't feel quite like a piece, and yet the piece has been going on for quite a while. So Means is trying to figure out exactly what does that mean. So let's just look, 577. As the 19th century draws to its close, it is impossible not to contrast the political ideals now dominant with those of the preceding era. 
It was the rights of man, right, our understanding of natural right, which engaged the attention of the political thinkers of the 18th century. The world had suffered so much misery from the results of dynastic ambitions and jealousies. The masses of mankind were everywhere so burdened by the exactions of the superior classes of mankind as to bring about a re universal revulsion against the principle of authority. Government, it was plainly seen, had become the vehicle of oppression and the methods by which it could be subordinated to the needs of individual development and could be made to foster liberty rather than to suppress it were the favorite study of the most enlightened philosophers. In opposition to the theory of divine right, whether of kings or demagogues, the doctrine of natural rights was set up. I wouldn't have quite put it that way. I would say was discovered or uncovered or recognized, but we'll give Means his due here. Humanity was exalted above human institutions. Man was held superior to the state. And universal brotherhood supplanted the ideals of national power and glory. So think about even the very title of this publication is called The Nation. And remember what we talked about when we were talking about the end of the Civil War, that, that grammatical change that makes all the difference in the world. The United States are going to act versus the United States is going to act. Um, we've begun to nationalize, and we saw that already in a very kind of sophomore kind of way, in a very young kind of way with Lincoln's Gettysburg Address, where he mentions the nation and the power of the nation three times, not the union, not the republic, but the nation. And that, that idea of nationalism has been growing significantly in Western civilization for quite a while. Those of you who took me for Western civilization, for Western heritage, you'll remember that we talked quite a bit about the rise of the nation state in the 1400s and how the nation state had to really have three things to help define it. It had to have in some way the ability to gather taxes. It had to have in some way the ability to protect itself against external threats and external tax collectors. And it had to find a way to educate its citizens so that those citizens thought of that area of the world as the primary area of the world before they thought of anything else. Now, this, this is an absolute violation of the liberal arts. The liberal arts, of course, teach us to be citizens of the world, to be citizens of the cosmopolis, of the city of God, to have our unity and our citizenship not in any one polis but in the polis of all humankind and now we get the rise in the 1400s of this idea of creating a centralized authority around a territorial piece of land around a piece of land around a soil and out of that soil grows a kind of brotherhood and that's really rare in the history of the world. Even think back to the time period of St. Paul and what matters for him as a Roman citizen is not what soil he's on, but that he's a Roman citizen. And it matters not what soil in which he was born, but that he was a Roman citizen. And he got away with a lot for a while because he was a Roman citizen. That idea of citizenship has been a part of the Western tradition that is not based on territorial understanding or some collective based on well, the common dirt that we all hold, but something higher than that. And of course, we talked about this when we looked at people like George Washington and they talked about my country, or when we looked at Cato, a tragedy, my country. You know, what does it mean to have a country? It means to belong to something superior to a mere piece of land. But now that's changing. We're seeing in the 19th century, especially this incredible movement towards nationalism. And we're seeing it in a rather benign way in places like America. You know, when we have uh, an ideal of nationalism that Abraham Lincoln gives us, that means all men are created equal. Well, that kind of, even though it's based on a soil, 
it's a soil that is giving us the means to do what we've been trying to do since the Stoics, uh, and really since the first pre-Socratic philosophers, right? What are we trying to do? Well, we're trying to create equality. We're trying to create a fellowship among men and women, among humankind, to get something universal there and figure out who and what we are and allow America to be that place in which all peoples can come and share in the celebration and brotherhood and doctrine of who we are. But now we have places like Germany that are unifying very quickly. And how are they unifying? Well, they're unifying based on a kind of rugged ideal, an ideal that tries to overcome the differences in Germany. So there are two major religions in Germany. And in the 1850s, for example, you have in almost all of northern Germany, a really roughly about 60% of Germany, is Lutheran. And then you have the minority part in the south, but still coming close to being a large, very large minority, and being almost half of the population, the Catholics. And the Lutherans and the Catholics don't get along, and there's a different character between the Prussian and the Bavarian. And one of the things that Bismarck, as the unifier of Germany, has to figure out is how to create that unity when there is such disunion among the German people. And so what does Bismarck gravitate towards? He gravitates towards a kind of pagan ideal. Well, what is it that we were before we became Christian, before we had the divide of Lutheran and Catholic? Well, we were these kind of noble, barbaric pagans. And so in almost all all of the paintings, in all of the art of Bismarck Germany, Bismarckian Germany, we see this kind of very primitive pagan return to uh, pictures of young men with very blonde hair and very blue eyes and very angelic features, but also very noble in their bearing because they're looking essentially like Nordic myth. And you know, we know what's going to happen with that. We know how dangerous that idealism of an ideal stereotype, of a stereotype of a physical characteristic, we know, which of course it'll be called Aryan here relatively quickly, that ideal of Aryan superiority is going to create major problems in the world. So two very different kinds of nationalism. One, the very kind of comforting, benign nationalism of Abraham Lincoln, and the other, the extremely disturbing and dark nationalism, the racial nationalism that we're starting to see grow and virulently in places like Austria and Germany, where they're trying to find that ideal stereotype. And it can be very, very dangerous. So again, let's repeat what Godkin says here. Humanity was exalted above human institutions Man was held superior to the state, and universal brotherhood supplanted the ideals of national power and glory. These 18th century ideas, turn the page 578, these 18th century ideas were the soil in which modern liberalism, remember the Jeffersonian type, flourished. Under their influence, the demand for constitutional government arose. Rulers were to be the servants of the people and were to be restrained and held in check by bills of right and fundamental laws which define the liberties, proved by experience, common law, to be the most important and the most vulnerable. Hence arose the movement for parliamentary reform in England with its great outcome, the establishment of what was called free trade, but which was really the overthrow of many privileges besides those of the landlords. Hence arose the demands for constitutional reform in all the countries of Europe, abortive and unsuccessful in certain respects, but frightening despots into a semblance of regard for human liberty, and into practical concessions which at least curb despotic authority. Republics were established, and constitutions were ordained. The revolutions of 1848 proved the power of the spirit of liberalism, and where despotism reasserted itself, it did so with fear and trembling.
To the principles and precepts of liberalism, the prodigious material progress of the age was largely due. So, natural rights, common law, constitutional ideals, restraints through bills of rights, all of these things allowed the human person to flourish, to become what the human person was meant to be by God and nature, unlike being made in the image of some ruler. And all of that came out of that 18th century idealism, best expressed by Burke and expressed so well by George Washington and Thomas Jefferson, out of those ideas of we understand what the human person is at minimum, a being endowed with the rights that are inalienable of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And beyond that, we make no claim. But because beyond that, every person must have moral authority to make their own decisions moment by moment, minute by minute, hour by hour, and day by day. There, every person, through free will, becomes a moral agent. And in that moral agency, once they have been endowed by God with the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, they make their own decisions. Freedom is messy. Life is messy. Liberty is messy. But that's exactly what these people understood. So they're willing to define the bare minimum of who and what we are as human persons. But after that, it's not enough to be in the bare minimum. Then instead, we must allow for the flourishing of the human person, but according to the lights of each individual human person, once we've defined the universal thing that holds them together. So again, we have means telling us in this piece, The Eclipse of Liberalism, to the principles and precepts of liberalism, the prodigious material progress of the age was largely due. Freed from the vexatious meddling of governments, men devoted themselves to their natural task, the bettering of their conditions, with the wonderful results which surround us now. But it now seems that its material comfort has blinded the eyes of the present generation to the cause which made it possible. Now, this is an old old lament, going all the way back to the Old Testament. And what do we find? The people are given freedom and they flourish. And what do they stupidly do? They worship the flourishing and not he who gave us the freedom. So they look at the stuff, not what allowed the stuff to come into being. They completely miss the mark. And by looking at the result rather than at the cause, and especially at the prime mover, the Lord himself, rather than doing that, they become fascinated by their own creativity. They become titillated by their own inventiveness. They become nothing but extremely clever monkeys. And as clever monkeys, they miss what's most important to society. And by focusing on the stuff, they forget what made all of that possible merely as a fringe benefit. The stuff is not the goal. Freedom is the means and the goal, but we get this fringe benefit of being productive with freedom as well. In the politics of the world, liberalism is a declining, almost defunct force. The condition of the Liberal Party in England is indeed parlous. There is actually talk of organizing a liberal imperialist party, a combination of repugnant tendencies and theories as impossible as that of fire and water. On the other hand, there is a faction of so-called liberals who are so little understood in their own traditions as to make common cause with the socialists. Only a remnant, old men for the most part, still uphold the liberal doctrine, and when they are gone, it will have no champions. It, we can't imagine something more repugnant than the mixing of liberalism with socialism. And yet, of course, that is exactly what 20th century liberalism will become. The tainting of 19th century liberalism with socialist principles. And it will vary. So in the 20th century, we'll see figures 
who will just completely embrace the idea of socialism within liberalism, but we'll have others who still reject it as well. You can think of people like John F. Kennedy, who's a liberal, but clearly not a socialist. Or you can think of his successor, uh, Lyndon Baines Johnson, who was a liberal, but also very deeply a socialist as well. So we're going to see that coming into the 20th century as the norm, this mixing of socialism with liberalism. True liberalism has never been understood by the mass of the French people. And while it has no more consistent and enlightened defenders than the select group of orthodox economists that still reverence the principles of Trigot and say, there is no longer even a liberal faction in the chamber. Much of the same is true of Spain and of Italy and of Austria, while the present condition of liberalism in Germany is in painful contrast with what it was less than a generation ago. In our country, recent events show how much ground has been lost. So remember, this is 1900. The Declaration of Independence no longer arouses enthusiasm. It is an embarrassing instrument which requires to be explained away. Now imagine only 35 years ago, the Declaration of Independence was the mechanism by which the Union justified not only its attack and war against the South, but by which it redefined by fulfilling the ideals of the revolution, by defining equality for black men as well as for white men. So the Civil War only 35 years ago had been based on an understanding of the Declaration. Now, we could argue whether that understanding was exactly correct or not, but I do think that overall it was a fulfillment of what the founders had projected. But now in 1900, it's an embarrassing document. And we have to think about why is that the case. The Constitution is said to be outgrown, and at all events, the rights which it guarantees must be carefully reserved to our own citizens and not allowed to human beings over whom we have purchased their sovereignty. The great party which boasted, the Republican Party, that it had secured for the Negro the rights of humanity and of citizenship now listens in silence to the proclamations of white supremacy and makes no protest against the nullification of the 15th Amendment. Its mouth is closed, for it has become patriot only in pernicious toils. And the present boasts of this champion of humankind are to mix with kings in the low lust of sway, yell in the hunt, and share the murderous prey, to insult the shrine of liberty with spoils, from Richmond torn to tempt and betray. Nationalism, in the sense of national greed, has supplanted liberalism. We have become a society which, though 35 years ago argued fiercely to the point of allowing 700,000 men to die in battle, that all men are created equal. And now the very party that was founded in 1854 by Ransom Dunn and others out of Hillsdale and out of Ripon, Wisconsin, that Republican Party now listens in silence to the proclamations of white supremacy. It had been created to prevent slavery from increasing in the territories, from expanding in the territories. Now it is mute, mute and deaf. It is dumb as it watches all of this horrific white supremacy developing. So nationalism in the sense of national greed has supplanted liberalism. It is an old foe under a new name, and by making the aggrandizement of a particular nation a higher end than the welfare of mankind, it has sophisticated the moral sense of Christendom. Right? It has sophisticated it. It has made it false. It has taken the ideals of Christianity, but imbued them with these false essences. It has allowed us to focus 
not on the human being, but on certain human beings who happen to live in a certain nation. And we can even take it farther with places like Germany. They better all look alike. They better all be blonde and blue-eyed. So what do we have? Aristotle once justified slavery because barbarians were naturally inferior to Greeks. We have gone back to that philosophy. We hear no more of natural rights in which all men, black, white, male, female, Greek, Jew, all are created equally in the image of God and endowed with those inalienable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. We hear no more of natural rights but of inferior races, whose part it is to submit to the government of those whom God has made their superiors. The old fallacy of divine right has once more asserted its ruinous power, and before it is again repudiated, there must be international struggles on a terrific scale. Now talk about an element of prophecy. He has already anticipated, even though he is writing in a time of peace, Means has anticipated already World War I and World War II. He has anticipated all the Cold War, everything that's going to happen, not with specifics. right? He doesn't know that. But he recognizes that there is no possibility that we in the Western world can move towards these ideals of racism and nationalism without there being a huge, huge penalty, without there being some kind of corrective that will force us to come back to the ideals of natural rights, we hope, in the end, but it will be a brutal adjustment getting back there. So again, let's read that last part. Nationalism in the sense of national greed has supplanted liberalism. It is an old foe under a new name, and by making the aggrandizement of a particular nation a higher end than the welfare of mankind, it has sophisticated the moral sense of Christendom. We hear no more of natural rights, but of inferior races, whose part it is to submit to the government of those whom God has made their superiors. And of course, by natural right theory, there is no such thing. God never makes one human superior to another. In the broad, he only does that through individual gifts. So through the individual, there are individuals who are superior in certain respects, to other individuals, but we never have groups of individuals who are superior in a way over other groups of individuals. That cannot happen according to natural rights theory. The old fallacy of divine right has once more asserted its ruinous power, and before it is again repudiated, there must be international struggles on a terrific scale. So we're already anticipating the horrors and the hell of the 20th century. So there are a couple of things I would like you to keep in mind that as we're thinking about this transition into the 20th century, a couple of things that I think are really, really important. So let me give you three. Well, actually, let me let me make it four. Four ideals that I think you need to know as we're moving towards the 20th century. Number one, at the end of the 19th century, there was, not surprisingly, especially given what we just read in terms of the ideals here that we see in the loss of natural rights, there is a loss of faith throughout much of the world at the end of the 19th century, especially throughout much of the Western part of the world. And we can say that, of course, this has been happening for a long time, but it happens very dramatically in the 19th century. And we start seeing what will arise as a kind of opposition between those evangelicals and fundamentalists within Protestantism and hardcore Catholics being seen as bizarre backward people who are not allowing for the evolution of society in the way that Darwin understood it. So religion is becoming one of those things, not just by the ideologues, but by mainstream thinkers in the West. It's becoming one of those stumbling blocks to progress. And we at Hillsdale may think that there's not much in common between, say, a hardcore Catholic and a hardcore evangelical, but at this point in the history of the world, the hardcore Catholic and the hardcore evangelical have 
everything in common because they are now on the outs with the world. In America, we'll see this fight come to fruition in what was known as the Scopes Monkey Trial in Tennessee in the 1920s. We're not quite year there yet, but we're moving very quickly in that direction. Number two, not surprisingly, what we just talked about, we have this rise of nationalism. Nationalism is everywhere. And nationalism is taking the place of republicanism and of what means just called liberalism. It's taking the place of natural rights theory and natural law theory. And it's developing these hierarchies of race throughout the world. So one of my one of my favorite authors of the nineteen of the nineteenth century of the eighteen hundreds was an English historian and philosopher by the name of Lord Acton, and he wrote an essay in the early eighteen sixties, already fearing this rise of nationalism, and he made this point. He says Christianity always rejoices at the mixture of races. But nationalism always identifies with their differences. And because truth is universal, errors are always various and particular. So the nation is starting to demand unity of thought and culture and economics and politics. It's creating a kind of false religion. In fact, as God can says, and in just and in each case, what we find is a substitute religion or counter religion, which transcends the limits of the political state and creates a kind of church. Right? That that's the great deadliness. I'm sorry, that was not Acton. That was a, a historian, Christopher Dawson. But before we had Acton, that is, Christianity rejoices at the mixture of races, and nationalism identifies itself with the differences. Because truth is universal, but errors are various and particular. So we're seeing that rise of nationalism. And the church is creating, or the, the state is creating itself to be a new kind of religion, but based on very dangerous and false ideals. So this leads to point number three. We're now starting to see the growth and the rise of what we can call ideologies. And I'll, I'll try and define this. It's not an easy word to define by any means. Ideologies are in the simplest form of understanding, not particular ways of thinking. In, in the 21st century, we often throw ideology around as just a, a that's my viewpoint. So well, you have your ideology, I have my ideology. That actually doesn't work at all. Ideology doesn't fit if it's just one lone individual believing something. An ideology is can come from an individual. In fact, it quite often does, just like we identify communism with Marx, uh, and, and rightfully so. When we do that, ideologies can go back to a person, but they generally have to be widespread in their appeal and in what they're trying to do. It's usually not just an individual trying to reform himself. It becomes more than that. So ideology, the word, goes back, strangely enough, and, and somewhat ironically, it goes back to the French Revolution. And that's not ironic. That makes sense. But it goes back to one of the specific characters of the French Revolution, Napoleon. And Napoleon had first used the term ideology to kind of bash people within his own party, within the French Revolutionary Party that he didn't like. And he said that they focused so much on ideals that they created a science of idiocy. And that, that's the original term of ideology, the science of idiocy. And it's this belief that you can take one idea and focus on it so much that you can exclude other ideas. In other words, as C.S. Lewis said, an ideology is the taking of one truth and exploding it to madness. So in communism, we have the truth that we should love our fellow man. Uh, we should believe in community. That's a great, great truth. There is nothing false about that. But it becomes 
utterly false when it is a truth that excludes all other truths. And that's what an ideology does. An ideology is a narrowing of ideas and then an explosion of that idea to cover everything. So at Hillsdale, there should never be any professor who teaches anything that's even remotely ideological, left or right. right? Ideology is absolutely counter to the liberal arts way of thinking. The liberal arts way of thinking is, of course, always based in principles and pursuing the good, the true, and the beautiful, but it has to rely on dogma. It has to rely on the idea that there are a variety of good little truths, many of which we do not and never will know, nor should we know. Ideology says just the opposite. We should know all things, and we know all things through this one idea. So this one idea covers all of our questions and all of our answers. This one idea is applicable not just for this person, but for all of these persons. And we will make them believe in it because we believe in it. And we have essentially, through an ideology, we have created a secular faith. That's another way to think about ideology. An ideology is, for all intents and purposes, a secularization of faith. And hence, what do we see when we talk about the Marxists? They have their martyrs. They have their saints. They have their demigods. They have their Moses figure in Marx. They even talk about their utopia as creating heaven on earth. They called other ideologies that they disagreed with heresies. So almost everything they do in terms of ideology is this ideal of an actual religion. And so what do we find? We find that there is always this emotional appeal. So I will actually, I want to quote here from one of my favorite scholars of the 20th century, Richard Pipes of Harvard in his little book called Communism. He says, there is always the emotional appeal of this belief, and it is not different from the religious faith or a faith in the will of God, inspiring those who hold it to hold it with unshakable conviction that no matter how many setbacks setbacks their cause may suffer, ultimate victory is reassured. Another great figure of the 20th century, a poet by the name of Robert Conquest, says that ideology, and specifically he was talking about Marxism, but it applies to ideology, is nothing less than mind slaughter. Mind slaughter, the destruction of our ability to think independently. So ideologies will arise here. So I hope that makes sense. Uh, On the final, I will almost certainly ask you about what an ideology is and what the nature of ideology is. We're going to talk a little bit more about it. We've got two other readings that deal specifically with ideology. One, and we'll see by Walter Lippmann coming right up, and his idea of the dominant dogma of the era, and then we'll also have Whitaker Chambers' witness, which deals with the question of ideology as well. So we're not done with that. In fact, for the rest of the semester, ideology is going to be kind of hovering behind us. But ideology is is nastiness. It is not good, um, and you should not believe in an ideology. <laughs> it's not not a healthy thing for anyone to believe in an ideology, left or right isms are bad. There, Brad Berzer's words for the day, isms are bad. I I don't know how many of you have ever seen the movie Ferris Bueller's Day Off, but there's that great moment where Ferris is singing in the shower and he says, I don't believe in fascism, right? I'm, I am the walrus. Uh, this great moment. He doesn't believe in any isms. Uh, he just believes in himself. And there's something very powerful in that statement because it's a natural right statement. I, I'm not sure John Hughes meant, eh, he may have, he was pretty conservative actually. But anyway, there's that great moment. And, uh, yeah, that should be a reminder that you should all go back and watch Ferris Bueller's Day Out anyway. It's, uh, yeah, that came out my senior year of high school. So great. Great timing, right? I'm Ferris's age. Can you believe it? All right. So number four in our list of things that you need to know, and that is, as we've already talked about, this faith in progress, this idea of progressivism. So let me go over those again really quickly. Number one, we have the loss of of religious faith in the world. Number two, we have a movement towards nationalisms. Number three, we see the rise of ideologies. And number four, all of the faith that is lost with religion is transferred to ideology and specifically to progress. And 
I, I will state here categorically that progress and progressivism is evil. It does not matter what the progressive thinks. The progressive, as we have already talked about, never has a complete understanding of man. Because in the progressive understanding of history, there is always a winner and there is always a loser, which means there is always a good guy and there's always a bad guy. It does not allow, the theory of progress does not allow for the possibility of the common good. It does not allow for the possibility of redemption and therefore it cannot be humane. It sees history as a never ending clash between various forces ending in a kind of utopia. It is relentless. And we find that progressives in general, and remember they can be right or left, Progressivism, even though in our current understanding in 2020, we usually identify that with left-wing theory, there are a number of right-wing progressives. Francis Fukuyama in the modern world is a right-wing progressive. George Bush, our former president, is a right-wing progressive. Uh, these people believe inexorably in the idea of conflict they do not believe in the common good. They believe in the greater good, and they will use military force and other things to attain that, even though what they're trying to attain is an impossibility. The, the progressives are relentless. And one of the most dangerous theories that develops, especially with extreme progressivism, at the turn of the last of the previous century, right, of the 19th to the 20th century, of that turn was the idea that progressivism is inevitable, progress is inevitable. There will always be people who stand in the way of progress, but progress will cut them down. And it is actually acceptable in radical progressivism to cut those people down in order to allow history to flourish. So a very famous moment when there was a famine in Russia, Lenin, before he was in charge, this would have been around 1900, said, whatever you do, never aid the, in the famished farmer, because by doing so, you will only allow the present system to perpetuate itself. The farmer will think, yes, I can survive with this present system and will not change revolutionary consciousness. So a huge part of progressivism is the idea that we can change the very consciousness, the very thinking, the intellect, this is why it's called mind slaughter, the very intellect of man, Political correctness that we have today is nothing but mind slaughter. It is an attempt to conform us, not through manners in the liberal arts, but through peer pressure and the idea that all of history is moving in a certain way. Now, there are reasons political correctness has arisen, and some of those reasons are just reasons. We've lost our manners, and as our losing our manners, we deserve to be chastised. It's just not a good solution to losing our manners, is forcing this kind of dull tapioca conformity. Progressives are always conformist. They're always relentless. They're usually pretty stupid, too. Uh, they may be very brilliant in their own ideas, but they're not able to think beyond those ideas. They don't have a vision of understanding things beyond what they understand at that point. So why do all these things take hold in America? That, that should be one of our great questions. How is it that Americans, of all people, started thinking about the ideal of progress? Well, most importantly, one of the reasons that we have this ideal of progress is because of Darwinian evolution and people changing their minds about what makes the human person. And we don't have to in this right now. We don't have to argue, and, and thank God as a historian, I don't have to argue whether evolution is true or not. It doesn't matter if it's true or not. It's been believed to be true. And as a truth that's become accepted by most people, it means that, of course, what are we? We are highly developed apes. Well, if you believe you are a highly developed ape, and of course that means you're going to keep developing, so we're going to keep evolving, we're going to keep progressing, there's no static human being, well then, why not be a racist pig dog? Why not label that race as less involved than this race? Darwinianism, however right it may be scientifically, opens up the whole understanding of anthropology and humanity to terrible, 
terrible thoughts and concepts. Right? Imagine how different that is from God in his goodness created man, and from man he created woman. Well, that has a billion implications, almost all of them good. But if you're just a really evolved monkey, and some of you are more evolved than others, there's not much good that's going to come out of that, right? That, in under, now again, whether it's scientifically true or not, from the humanity's standpoint, those are very dangerous stories that we tell ourselves. Because once we have that belief, well, then what happens? Okay, so I, I've been going on a long time about this, and I, I want to kind of close this up. Why do Americans think this? They think this for two reasons they come to think this. Not all, by any means, but kind of the elite Americans. In America, in the period after the Civil War, there grows a deep elitism among those original ethnic stocks that had migrated to America. So among the old Anglicans and Puritans and Quakers, although there aren't that many Quakers around anymore, and Scotch-Irish, those original four free migratory peoples remember, made up America. They were the common stock of America really until about 1846. In 1846, you get the Irish and the Germans and the Scandinavians coming over, and they're very evenly divided between Catholic and Lutheran. Now, I realize that many of you think of Lutherans as Protestants, Many Lutherans don't think of themselves as Protestants, except as Catholics. Uh, but we have to understand one thing. In the 19th century, Lutherans were not really regarded by other Protestants as Protestants. They were regarded as a kind of form of Catholicism. So when I say Catholic and Lutheran in the 19th century, they're all going to be German or Scandinavian if they're, they're Lutheran. And they will not have a very high reputation among mainstream white Anglo-Saxon Celtic Americans, right? What, what we could call wasps, but it doesn't quite fit because it would be wasps if we do the Anglo-Saxon Celtic, right? But those mainstream people. Then in the 1880s, we see another huge flux of immigrants coming in, mostly from places like Italy and Greece. That will continue for a very long time, leading all the way up until 1900, where in 1900, if we were to walk, for example, through the city of New York, we would find that six out of every 10, right, three out of every five people would not speak English as their native language. The United States was receiving close to one million immigrants a year around 1900. Many of these people came, worked, and went home. That is, they went back to the, to the old country. But others came and they formed huge ethnic neighborhoods, a Polish neighborhood here, a Swedish neighborhood here, an Italian neighborhood here, a Sicilian neighborhood here, a Jewish neighborhood here. And this this was deeply, deeply worrisome to many mainstream Americans who felt that the world itself was radically changing because of all these new peoples coming into America. So I, I want to read to you just very briefly. Um, here, This is a, a terrible, th this book, I mean, it's a horrible book, but it was a, a mainstream book in 1914 when it came out and it's called the old world in the new by a guy named E.A. Ross and what he does and he was a member of both the Teddy Roosevelt and the Woodrow Wilson administrations what he does is he goes through and he looks at all the different immigrant groups coming into America and he tries to show what is disadvantageous around each one he goes through Sicilians and Danes and, and Swedes. He goes through uh, Northern Italians and Jews and various Germans, and he tries to break them apart. But this is what he says towards the end of his book. This is, this is deeply disturbing. Just I want to warn you before I say it, right? Dr. Berzer is going to trigger you. In this sense, it is fair to say that the blood now being injected into the veins of our people is sub-common. So much for natural rights. To one accustomed to the aspect of the normal population, this Caliban type shows up with frequency. That is startling. 
I don't suggest they are evil, but check out the fact that they are hirsute, low-browed, big-faced persons of obviously low mentality. These are ox-like men who always stayed behind. Now, think about that problem. What's wrong with these immigrants? They're the kind who always stayed behind. Well, then what are they doing on American soil if they stayed behind? They seem to have come here for a very serious region, a reason. Well, anyway, as Ross says, to the practiced eye, the groups unmistakably proclaim inferiority of type. I have seen gatherings of the foreign dashboard in which narrow and sloping foreheads were the rule. The shortness and smallness of the crania are very noticeable. And there was much facial asymmetry. Among the women, beauty, aside from that fleeting, ephemeral gloom, uh, bloom of girlhood, was quite lacking. In every face there was something wrong. A mouth coarse, an upper lip too long, cheekbones too high, a chin poorly formed, the bridge of the nose hollowed, and the base of the nose tilted, or as something wrong with the face. There were so many sugarloaf heads, moon faces, slip mouths, lantern jaws, and goosebill noses that one might imagine a malicious gin had amused himself by casting human beings in a set of skew molds discarded by the Creator. Now, just imagine that idea. Maybe all of these people came because the devil found some discarded people that God didn't want, and he made them in his image rather than God's image. Well, think about all the horrible theological implications of that. But there you have racism and progress and all of that right in a nice little racist, nasty package, right? All of this progress. No human dignity, no human rights at all. So he concludes that we will one day think about the people who imported these immigrants in the same way that we think about the people who imported slaves. The overlooked that this man will beget children in his image two or three times as many as the American will. I guess those immigrants are having a lot of sex. And that these children will turn and beget other children they chuckle at having opened an inexhaustible, inexhaustible store of cheap labor, and lo, the American people is being altered for all time by these tools. Once before, captains of industry took a hand in making this people. Colonial planters imported Africans to hoe in the sun to develop the tobacco, indigo, and rice plantations. Then as now, business-minded men met with contempt the protests of a few idealists against their way of, quote, building the country. Motors of prosperity are dust, but they bequeathed a situation which in four years wiped out more wealth than 200 years of slavery had built, and which presents today the one unsolvable problem in our country. Without likening immigrants to Negroes, one may point out how the latter-day employer resembles the old-time planter in his blindness to the facts of his labor policy upon the blood of the nation. Let us never be like E.A. Ross. Ne let us never look at a human being merely by the accidents of their skin. Rather, let us always see the image of God uniquely reflected in each human being. Let us believe in natural law and natural rights. All right, guys, that's it for today. God bless. I think I went a little bit over time. Sorry about that. But God bless, and I will see you in two days.